here at Oran Park and a very interesting front row. It was all HRT in race one, but Marcus Ambrose has climbed into the occasion, or equation, both as a matter of fact. With Russell Ingle, his teammate, just behind he and Mark Skate, then we have Jason Bright. This is the grid based on the placings from the previous round. And interestingly enough, if Ambrose wins this race and Skate finishes second, they'll be tied on points. Ambrose will still win the round. We've checked the regulations on that because he's won the last race. Todd Kelly, a little bit off the pace after uh, struggling a bit in the closing stages of the previous race. Jason Barkwider in the middle of a bit of a storm over that wayward uh, fire extinguisher that found its way on the uh, track. That's the second of the mysteries we've had to try and unravel this weekend, and they're not easy. The other one was, of course, Jason Bright's team finding bolts in the number one cylinder of their engine. That is quite amazing. The implications of that are extraordinary as we run through the uh, grid uh, towards the back now. We'll have some more in a moment on that uh, remarkable situation with Greg Rust. There you go, Stephen Johnson and Craig Baird down the back. After some problems in the first race, and Max Wilson, of course, had big problems. Getting ready now. Cloud coming in, but uh, still no sign of rain here. Ambrose versus Scaife. And they're off in race two. A big, big run to this first. Very important corner. You have to get it right. Wow. And Ambrose... What is going on here? Scaife, he must have missed a gear or he's really bogged it down badly, but Ambrose is absolutely blown him away to the first corner. Well, they came off the line together. We watched the rest of the field file past. But as you say, Neil, Scaife must have done something wrong after that. But Ambrose with a very important break early. Maybe he bogged it down a little bit after he'd launched it. The launch looked very good from car number two, but certainly look at that margin. So he's either grabbed the wrong gear on the way down to turn one or bogged down badly after he got the initial launch, but Ambrose absolutely braining him at the moment. Oh, this will be interesting. Now, this car had great speed later in the race. The way they'd set it up was obviously a little kinder on the tyres than the HRT cars, although having said that, Skate still managed to hang on for the win and uh, had a couple of seconds up his sleeve. So the pattern of this race now with Ambrose in front and Skate having to chase will be very interesting. John Bauer there finishing 12th in the first race. That was one heck of a charge from the very back of the grid. He's got a very quick car this weekend, but when you start from rear of grid, it's hard to use it. Garth Walton with a problem, and he's got oil pouring out of the back of that car, so the next time around for the leaders is going to be pretty hairy on that stuff. Once again, kissing the apex on turn one. Oh, Richard's down the inside here of Paul Wheel. He managed to just get away with that. Gets down the inside. 1.3 seconds, the margin between Ambrose and Scape at the end of the first lap. Then a small gap there to Todd, uh, between Todd Kelly and Russell Ingle. Kelly and Scape virtually together. Lowndes is coming in. He's got a problem with the car. The oil flag, the brief flag being shown there on the right-hand side of the screen as everybody comes off the top of the bridge at the moment. Ambrose Scape, Todd Kelly, Russell Ingle. False start for car number 33, Cameron McConville, and Garth Tander's in as well. So Tander and Lowndes, and McConville will get a drive-through penalty. Look at the left rear on that car. So bad news here for Valvoline. What's the problem with the Lowndes? It looks like he's made contact with someone. They're replacing the front right wheel and tyre. Replay here from the start, the Zinger replay. The launch, what happens? Scafey gets a good launch, but then what? No, look, it was just an ordinary start. I think it bogged down a little bit, and Marcus got a ripper. Shades at Willowbank, where Marcus's brilliant start gave him a victory from pole position. That was a 300-kilometre race. Now, Scafe all over the back of Ambrose. And he was the fastest man on the last lap, Bill. A 10-7 plays an 11-5 for Marcus Rusty. Neil, they've got the uh, the left rear wheel off Garth Tander's car. Everyone's crawling around underneath it here at Gary Rogers Motorsport, but some puzzled faces. It's either a damaged or broken Watts linkage, they seem to think, but they haven't been able to, to find it, so they're going to throw some tyres at this car and send Garth Tander out. Sounds like a bit of confusion in the background there. A lot of people screaming, a lot of pressure in these situations. They were expecting to have a pretty reasonable weekend, I think, in the Valvoline team, and it's all gone away because McConville's going to serve a drive-through as well in car 33. 
So Ambrose under pressure here from Scape. Remember, compulsory pit stop for tyres only between laps 20 and 30. It's a mirror race of the first race earlier today. Looking here at Jason Richards in the Tasman Motorsport car, it's got some nose damage. And Richards at the moment is sixth behind Russell Ingall. Well, the lap times towards the end of the first race suggest... Oh, oh Mark Warner turned around. By Stephen Richards, I think, was the guy that was immediately behind. And he was in the middle of such a closely knit group that he has lost a lot of positions. And Greg. Neil, as you can appreciate, the Orcon team were pretty excited about Jason Barguana after that excellent finish in the first race. Now, having said that, they're a little tight-lipped at the moment because they believe that fire extinguisher bomb that we saw in the first race, which had parted company with the car. The general feeling here at Pit Lane is that it could have come from car 10. They do mount theirs underneath the car, up near the rear wheel arch, so they're not saying too much at the moment in case there's a penalty post-race. Well, it's not a question of saying something or not. It either came from it or it didn't. The rules are clear that fire extinguisher bomb is going to be carried inside the car or there's a position that you can mount them on the floor at the rear outside the car and if it came off then the technical director and the stewards need to make a judgment based on that. Oh Jason Bright, you can hear that. Is that Russell Ingle in front of him on that occasion? Yes it is. So turn eight there's Richards trying to find a way through as well. Now, the front of his car looks all right at this point, so the damage that was done to his car comes later. Does it come right here? No, we're not going to see it. Replay here of turn three action. Traddy goes around. He's got Mark Noski with him there as well. 10-7, the fastest lap so far from Marcus Ambrose, and a 10-7-4-2-8 for Scaife. There's Ingle, Bright. Right behind them is Jason Richards. That's where Bargwiner was turned around. Stephen Richards gets past him. I'm not sure whether he was touched or not. That's another one for the onboard cameras and the stewards to review. Barguana lost 10 seconds in that manoeuvre. Scaife attacking Ambrose. Ambrose clicks on the fastest lap, 1.10.7. Incidentally, uh, I went and had a, a fossick around between the races and uh, Rick Kelly is actually quite ill this weekend and he's been on a saline drip to try and recover. He was uh, asleep between the races. But he uh, obviously ate something bad yesterday and it didn't agree with him. He's been ill all night. So he's doing a pretty mighty job to try and soldier on, given the circumstances, after what was a pretty strong day at one point yesterday. He remember, he was fastest in qualifying as the, at, at that point the pole man, and then he had uh, used his tyres up for the shootout and ended up being eighth. Incidentally, uh, Scaife went past that last uh, start-finish line as England and Bright continue their battle uh, just behind the top three. She's on here. Look at this. Bright, he's going to get down the inside. I don't think Russell's going to hold position here, no. You can't be wide at turn four, Bill. There's just nowhere to go. So Bright gets through. That's uh, fourth position Bright's just taken there. Scaife did a 110.50. Ambrose a 110.59. So they're trading blows, trading faster slaps here, Scaife and Ambrose. Remember that you've got a situation this weekend with 10 new tyres allocated for qualifying in these two races. So depending on how you've configured your car and the way you're going to use your tyres in the two segments of this race will depend on what your car's like at the moment. And for some people this weekend, the story of the whole weekend has been flat-spotted tyres. I've never seen so many flat-spotted tyres, most of them happening at Turn 2. So many times they've shared the front row. And today again in Race 2, they were on the front row. Ambrose won the start. Scape has paid for that by having to chase him all the way. But gee, it's close and tyre wear, tyre choice. What they have in the can for the first pit stop, which is coming up pretty soon. That'll be crucial, Neil. That's right. Mark uh, was three tenths of a second quicker on that last lap. And I'm going to be intrigued by the way in which everybody manages their rubber for this race, Billy. So just going back to that point, 10 tyres allocated as new for this weekend. By definition, you use eight of those in the first race, and so then you sit around between races and go, OK, how do we do it? We need another eight tyres. How do we manage it? Do we use, say, for example, our slightly better tyres for the first segment of the race, or do we use them for the second segment of the race, or do we just, you know, take pot luck? We're coming up to the point where the pit window will open. It's between laps 20 and 30. Compulsory tyre stop only. Uh, this is what happened during the break with Murph getting down the inside of Russell Ingle at the final corner and got that job done with a fair bit of space. 
and drama for Mark Winterbottom, damage on that car, pretty substantial, more than just a flat tyre and a damaged rim, the whole bottom of the splitter is missing off the front of the car and it looked like it might have also damaged the lower part of the radiator and possibly some other gear underneath it when the car was coming into the lane there were bits dangling from under the middle of it so it must have straddled a curve somewhere and yanked a bit of stuff off now 0.6 of a second is the margin between Ambrose and Skate and their dominance reflected in the margin back to Todd Kelly in third place Neil it's nearly 10 seconds 9.57 quite a freight train after that because uh, as we see a move through here, Simon Wills going through. That's the battle for 12th position. He went through, in fact, 11th position now. He just took Paul Morris's 11th position. Up ahead of them, Paul Radisic having a pretty handy run as well. 14th in the previous race, he's up to 10th. Remember that Glenn Seaton's also got two fresh sets of tyres. Great, Mark. Race. He's in uh, position 17 at the moment. He would have started up the back, of course. We spoke to him in the first race. John Bauer, the big march from the back sort of stops when you get to about the point where he is at the moment unless you've got a car that's unbelievably quick and it's so hard to get by but he's currently in uh, where 13th. Is he? 13th position so he's dropped a dropped a spot look at this scape getting much much closer now well, that gap had widened to a second uh after about 15 laps but in the last few mark scape has closed it up again and now we're in the window who will make the stop first who and what kind of tyres will they have to put on? Stone Brothers, we believe, are gearing up for a stop. He's pitting this lap too, mate, so it's up to you if you reckon you want to go another one. That's and HRT, to know, mate. Mate. The quick. Rob Starr on the radio. Mark just at the dog leg, further the throttle a little bit, and then back down the other side into the final corner. We've got to come in, mate. Take a punt. He's going to come in. Do a stop, do a stop. Marcus is going to do exactly the same thing. Speed limit, thing. mate. Watch the speed limit. Oh, oh, oh what happened there? Going to go past him. That was a mistake. That yes. was a mistake because in net terms, you put your foot on the brake, that costs you time because if you think about the elapsed time for Marcus in the following lap, he won't have his foot on the brake at that point. 45 now, seconds, the stop taken here, average for tyres. And uh, that's quite right, Neil, because whatever Marcus does for this pit stop, whatever time he does, it'll be... Uh, oh, he's got a couple of seconds, maybe, or... Mark Scaife will be ruining that. I'm, I'm surprised. He, he must have in. felt as though that uh, because the two of them are going to be so close down there that they could be slowed up by each other. Daryl. Yeah, Neil, Marcus is in. He's the only one in pit lane. He's had a nice clear run through Kmart into his pit. No adjustment to the roll centre, and out he goes. But will he come out in traffic? Will he have clean road? This is the important thing, too. He doesn't want to be held up. He comes out behind Brad and in front of Warren Luff. A few guys have come in for their stops. Jason Richards is in as well. So is Stephen Richards, Paul Morris, John Bauer, Stephen Ellery. But Ambrose, the only car in the top six to have made a stop. I, I can't understand why Mark decided to jump on the brakes at that point and abort. He called Rob and said, we're going to take a stop. And then he aborted the notion and kept going. Greg. Neil, I think the general consensus from Mark, he did chat a little bit longer on the radio, was that in wanting to keep that gap tight between he and Ambrose, he locked a break and he felt he was going to go past Marcus. He had to abort it, get out of it and keep going. Now, car two is in pit lane. This will be the crucial thing. How much does it cost Mark Scape? We're about to find out. Well, it'll have to be a good stop. That's all I can say. So maybe... If I can understand that, it's what you're saying is when he jumped on the brakes to come to the pits, he locked it and felt like he was going to basically drill him and he had to take evasive action. So maybe that's the explanation. Ambrose coming into the main straight. He's been through the dog leg. Make no mistake, it costs you time when you put your foot on the brake on the main straight. So it'll depend on what the outlap is like for Marcus, but I can't think of any reason why for any reason at all. Yeah, look at that. There's a huge gap. Yep. And Scaife just coming out now and has to feed back in behind Stephen Johnson, which will be a hold up for a little while. So that gives Ambrose. Position wise, you know, we'll still win the day. More breathing space. And that's interesting for Jeff Gregg. Uh, Greg Russ, can you add to that? Because we thought that Ambrose would win if he finishes first and Scaife finishes second. Really, just to, uh, to update Neil's point, the radio chat indicated that. It indicated that Mark either overshot it or perhaps just, just locked a break. It was, it was giving him here specifically what he said, but that's what it sounded like, and he had to abort it, get out of it. Otherwise, he was going to overtake Marcus on the way into pit lane, and that wouldn't have been a good thing. Just looking at Brad Jones' stop there, he was blueing after the first race because the adjoining pit bay operated by Triple Eight there, tree-sized gas bottles at boom, was positioned a little wider 
further away from those pit buildings, so he got trapped in the pin. He reckoned he was on for a tenth in the first race, but he had to reverse in order to clear the, the, the uh, car and the bottles and what have you and the pit burn apparatus. So he was very unhappy as Seaton comes in. Scott Kelly in for his stop now. Brighton Murphy is still out there, yet to come in. Go, 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 go! We focused on Ambrose and Skate because Todd. they weren't clearly the quickest in the first section of the race, Darrell. Yeah, Todd Kelly, Billy, he was in and out with wheels. Again, the same as the first race, he was the only one out of the two HRT cars that made the roll centre adjustment again. Well, I wonder if Kelly and a few others out there can buy into this race when Seaton comes in now. Great drive from him. Had grip on his side in that segment, so and another smart set of tyres were going. You can see he just grabbed first gear there, and that's why it just kicked the wheel around. Just feeding in behind David Bernard, who would be uh, ahead of him on the track, but uh, behind him in terms of race position. Bernard having to uh, make a stop earlier. Gary Rogers' team have had no luck this weekend, but have carried the speed that they showed at Winton through to Sydney as Greg Murphy trundles down pit lane. So Jason Bright and Rick Kelly, Greg's teammate, are the only guys out there yet to make their stops among the top ten. Darryl. Yeah, Murphy, nice run through HRT pit again. Pit lane, nice and quiet for Murphy. Good stop. Go, go. Ambrose just turned in the fastest race lap, 1-10-3-7. So he's trying to make hay while the sun shines. Scaifed hit a 1.10.5 for his fastest lap, but his latest lap was in the 1.11s. I think this was the ah. car that was splitting them after those stops. So, so Scaife might be able to reel in about six seconds, I think the gap was, as they last passed okay, the start. Okay, reset your bars for cold tyres. Yeah, that gives you an idea of what happens when you suddenly change your rhythm in a race car. You know, Mark had to back off, jump on the brakes, and then get it all wound up again. Now they have to shuffle through. Bright and Kelly are ahead on the timing monitor, but Ambrose will be the first of the cars to have made his pit stop. In fact, as they come through, Rick Kelly is now in the pits as well, Darrell. that time I was trying to have a bit of a look at the tyres that were going back onto these cars during that stop. I must say the tyres that went onto Ambrose's car did look pretty good. That's interesting because they finished the race very strongly in the first race, Daryl, and I thought maybe they might have hurt their tyres a little bit, but obviously that car continues to look after its tyres very well. Rick Kelly in, not feeling well today. Scars on the side of the car, comes right up onto his mark, Craig. Neil, the message from, uh, okay. from the guys and the team here for Rick Kelly was they did not have time for a change to that car. So just the tyres on for Kelly and car 15 is out of the lane. I noticed the weather's a little different out there again too, Greg. It doesn't look like it's quite as windy as it was in the first race. As not, as, not as windy, Neil. You did right there. So there's no real tailwind uh, that, uh, that the guys are having to contend with like they were in the first race. But the big change, cloud cover, some, uh, some real shaded parts of the track now compared to race one. Yes, and at one point there between races, I thought we may have been bathed in sunshine for the second one because it actually broke out nice and sunny and uh, it was quite pleasant. But it is very cloudy out there again at the moment, so that changes car behaviour once again. Well, it doesn't make any difference at all in terms of points. But uh, the big thing is, who will win the day? Marcus Ambrose, if he wins this second race, will take the round victory ahead of Mark Scaife, even though they will finish equal on points. That's assuming, of course, the positions stay the same. There's still plenty left in this race. We're only half distance. Jason Bright is out there trying to gain some clear track. He has 21 seconds up his sleeve on Ambrose, but, of course, yet to make his stop. Stephen Richards, sorry, I'm, uh, my apologies. Simon Wills has just turned the quickest uh, lap of the race at a 10-1. Haven't they shown some speed this weekend? And indeed, Simon uh, has been in five top ten shootouts this season as Bright does make his stop now. So yeah, okay. Max safety, Wilson, the only guy out there who hasn't. The safety retainer on the front left wheel, I think it was, was the drama for that car. And uh, they basically couldn't get the nut off. And 
uh, the cost them 29 seconds in the stop, but they have fantastic pace so and they're showing FBR, it again now. Yourself, but with the ball, pull up on me. Nice and easy on the stop, mate. Nice and easy. And the reason for nice and easy, see the concrete versus the asphalt, it has no grip at all. The important thing here for Jason is where he feeds go, back go. into the race. They're getting these cars serviced so efficiently now. It's fantastic to watch these crews at work. Great teamwork, great harmony. The result of a lot of practice, and uh, they are not easy things to manhandle, those wheels and tyres, uh, or for that matter, the guns. Well, people who, uh, who do get a chance to handle them for the first time in various promotions where you get to practice doing a pit stop for a bit of fun, the thing they remark on is the weight of the wheels. Marcus Ambrose is still the leader, but Scape has cut that down to less than four seconds. Ambrose has run into a lot of lapped traffic. He's trying to negotiate them. Scape following him through, and in doing that, has gained a little bit of time. But once Marcus cuts himself free, he should be able to pick that time up again. But of course, good luck and good management will play a part in that. Now, this is Seaton versus Bow, two of the old stages in the field. They'll hate me saying that, but they're still driving brilliantly, although on this occasion, Neil will let you be the judge of that. Uh, need to see the inside angle to know how far up the inside Glenn got, but I'd say that maybe he looked a bit dubious, but hard to know. That's one for race control to figure out. That's why they've got the cameras on the cars. And, of course, the corner marshals also uh, lodge reports on those. But uh... Ambrose running into another herd of cattle here, but Scaife is uh, further back trying to negotiate a f fleet of his own. A bit of a shame for both those guys this weekend because uh, Seaton not making the first race in Bow particularly quick car and sort of unable to use it because of uh, sliding on by the scales yesterday and missing the light signals. Oh, oh. oh big lock up there from Max Wilson and fortunately didn't tip anyone else out of the race but he has run off onto the dirt himself. You saw Scaife flash past there still trying to get through some of that traffic that Marcus bad luck, mate, bad negotiated luck. earlier. That was lucky. Could have been a lot worse. Car 45 is going to be showing the black flag as well. Uh, Dale Breed for loose body work. Here's a replay. Arrives into turn two, too hot, locks everything. And uh, the reason Car 45's got loose body work is that. <laughs> and he's going to get a black flag for it. Life is cruel. <laughs> Dale Breed had a little lock up there himself, but uh, anyway. Better electrical team. They'll have Craig Lowndes at their disposal next year, or Triple Eight Racing will. Ambrose lead on Scaife now is back over four seconds. Just a reminder, the V8 Superstar Show. Tickets still available until midday tomorrow on that number called Ticket Tech. More than 500 seats already sold, I believe, but it's going to be a big night. There's plenty of room in that Star City showroom. And just a reminder, the cutoff point is midday. There's Ambrose in the middle of traffic again. 10-6 last time through for Marcus. 10-9 for Marcus Gay. 4.6 seconds is the margin. Then Jason Bright third, Todd Kelly fourth. Russell Ingram, Paul Wheel, Stephen Richards, who's coming a bit, obviously made his car a bit stronger for the second race. Simon Wills, Greg Murphy, and, uh, Jason Richards, that's the top 10. The V8 Supercar website now features a great range of V8 Supercar products on sale, including a car care range, PC, PlayStation and Xbox game. It's so popular it's across three different platforms. The latest in V8 Supercar clothing and your Neil Crompton dolls will soon be available. They're coming online right now, only $9.99. Stick pins. In. You're an idiot, Phil. <laughs> Ambrose by four and a half seconds from Scape. Jason Bright is nearly 20 seconds adrift. That's the dominance of the two guys in front. What can Scape do? What can the tyres do? Now, car five, uh, that is Glenn Seaton, has been adjudicated as um, stepping across the line in that incident with John Bowen. He's going to serve the drive through and go down to pit lane with Darrell. Yes, Neil, I guess everyone's wondering why Todd Kelly's struggling again in this race. I just spoke to Jeff Gretsch. He said, that he wanted to stick to his own pace. Obviously, the tyres aren't as good for this race either. He didn't want to have a big flat spot, so he's just trying to go around and gain as many points as he can. Rusty? Just spoken a moment ago, just emerged from the Kmart Racing Bunker, having had a word with Rob Crawford. Greg Murphy has drifted down the order a little bit. Just heard Neil updating the, the top 10 there before. They thought they were saving their best set of rubber for car 51 for the, uh, the second installment of this race but Murphy says the rubber isn't working too well with the settings on that car at the moment he's doing his best to drive around it 
Simon Wills went past him not long ago, moving into eighth position. And I have to say, Simon Wills put down an extraordinary set of laps. Between laps 26 and 30, that's five laps. They were all fastest laps of the race. He was shaving hundreds each time, but obviously a very good sequence there from Simon Wills. Funnily enough, it didn't give him a lot of track position. He only overtook one driver in that period, and that was Jason Richards. But now he's got past Murphy. So Simon Wills is fighting his way back into some handy points here. 129 at the moment. It's been a question of kind of a lost weekend for these fellas this weekend because this car is obviously very quick and <clears throat> qualified well. And uh, that sticky uh, safety retaining lock on that car in the pit stop in the previous race has really cost them very dearly. But he drove very well yesterday. He drove the wheels off that car in the shootout. And, uh, in fact, I've mentioned a couple of times over the weekend, he almost overdrove it when he got down to turn two. Remaining. He sort of scooted round there and got the job done, but only just. But the rest of the lap was very committed, very fast, good job. And uh, Oscar and the engineering team there have done a very good job of making a fast car this weekend. It's a very, very difficult track to set up for. It's quite complicated. A lot of rise and fall, a lot of off camber. There's curbing to deal with. So you need to figure out correct suspension settings for lots of different varieties. You've got, you've got to have traction, for example, coming out of there in turn three. You've got to be able to get over the bumps at turn four. You have to deal with the surface change and the bumps at the top of the bridge here. See the big change of color and there's also quite a variation in the height of the road there. Then you need to deal with these undulations through turns six, seven and eight. And you have to be able to curb hop. And if you can get all that right, then you might get a result. And for Stephen Richards, Larry Perkins and that group this weekend, they've had a, a big job on their hands because the car has been a handful in the early part of the weekend and they've obviously made the car better now for the second race, season seven. Yeah, he didn't make the shootout and that is not a good sign because if you look at the way Ambrose was able to start this second race, it was a key factor in him being five seconds in front of Scaife now for the lead. But uh, Richo has fought back strongly and it's important championship points here at stake. 147 in the bag at the moment. We're looking at Paul Wheel just ahead of him on the track in sixth position. There he is, Richards bearing down on Wheel. In fact, one of the uh, few close battles among the top ten. There's a bit of spacing going on here. Ambrose, as I said, with the five second margin. 20 seconds to Bright. Then there's three seconds to Kelly. That's Todd. Two seconds to Wingle. Two seconds to Paul Wheel. It's not a huge amount, but... In terms of uh, track space, it gives the guys a bit of uh, time to breathe with 15 laps to go. And this battle here between Will and Richards is clearly the closest of the top guys. And Simon Wills is buying into that now as well. Still carrying plenty of speed, running in the 110s. One minute, 10.8 here. Oh, more problems for Max Wilson, the front left. Oh, that, Looks a bit second that. hand there. 10.8 for Ambrose, 11.1 on the last lap for Mark Stay. 5.4 seconds is the margin now, so it looks like Marcus has got his measure. And that hesitation in the pit stop for Mark Scape has proved to be quite costly, although I'm not sure that he's been able to do anything about Marcus this afternoon anyway because of the pace. They obviously found a little bit more again after what they learned from the first race in the SBR per tech forward. In goes Max, and that'll be more than a wheel alignment on that job. Well, Max has had worse attrition rates uh, in his years in V8 supercars, but uh, could be heading for his fifth DNF today. That's about 300 millimetres of toe out on the front left. <laughs> a bit overdone. In contrast, Paul Radisic up to 13th and uh, has fought very hard. And if you did join us late, he said it on RPM and we did say it earlier. Uh, there's a lot of smoke coming out there from the left front lockup. But uh, Paul Radisic is planning to stay in Australia and race next year. So we're helping Paul to put that fire out. I think we might have started it. So well, that's why I'm going to put them out. We'll be if we ignored every rumour in Pin Lane, we'd have nothing to talk about. Steve Ellery, that big lockup that you commented on a moment ago, Billy, it's uh, put such a mark on the tyre that he's coming in this lap to replace it. He's put a huge flat spot on the tyre. It's a real issue down there. It seems to be worse this year for some reason at Turn 2. I reckon that uh, Todd's starting to feel the sweat from... Russell Ingle here at the moment, third and fourth this argument. My apologies, fourth and fifth this argument because Bright's next up the road. Russell's got the lights on and he's carrying more speed into, around and possibly even out of the corner by the look of him. So once again, Todd's car may be a little harsh on its rubber. Ambrose lead, 5.6.
20 seconds to Bright. Five seconds to Kelly. So the top four now spaced out. There's Kelly. And he's facing a tough battle against Russell Ingle now, who's chewed up that two-second gap in an awful hurry. Russell's a good racer, isn't he? I mean, he just, um, whatever happens in qualifying and whatever happens in the early phase of the race, as the thing wears on, um, he grinds away at the task, and it's a mark of good concentration. Some frenzied racing, big-time tyre wear, and Mark Scaife, well, I don't know how he's feeling right now. He hasn't won the round here from here. He cannot win the round. He will finish equal on points, but the man who wins the last race wins the round. There's a shot of those marbles. Look at that. Massive amount of build-up on the top of the dog leg there and all the way down into the final corner. And look at it there on the outside. If you get on that stuff, you're a goner. But Russell Ingle was on the clean line when he got down the inside at turn 11 on Todd Kelly, made a clean move and uh, slots up one spot now to fourth. Ambrose, Scaife, Bright, Ingle, Wheel. And then Paul Wheel takes advantage as well on the way to turn two and he gets the job done. So once again, Todd's car is a little weak right at the very end of the stint. So the tyre's just hurting a bit on car number 22 as we go on board with Marcus Ambrose. Paul Wheel qualified, oh, Bradley Jones in trouble there. Paul Wheel qualified 22nd, I might add, and that's a good result. Bradley's dropped a cylinder. Actually, Bradley hasn't. The car has dropped a cylinder. He's running on. Bradley's How do been... you know Bradley hasn't dropped a cylinder? Well, actually, for many years, Bradley's <laughs> been running on only a few cylinders, but uh, that's another issue. But his car's running on seven. Fantastic end of the day. And uh, he's not too pleased about it, as you can imagine. He certainly won't enjoy my humour in the moment. 6.4 seconds. Marcus Ambrose to Mark Scaife. And tough weekend for these fellas because... Uh, there was an expectation that John had place in his car and when he missed the scales yesterday that was catastrophic and several people uh, have also noted that you know that's such a penalty you miss the scales you get put to the back of the grid it destroys your weekend you have an irregularity with the car and you get a fine mm. there's an interesting one to contemplate simon wheels applying the blowtorch here to todd kelly Stephen Richards, as you would have noticed, has got past Todd Kelly. So Todd is slipping down the order here. He's sixth at the moment. He may well lose that position too as Brad Jones peels off in the pit lane. I'd have to say that I'm not a huge fan of shifting the pit window either. You know, we've got it now between lap 20 and 30 for this race. And what it's done is it's closed out the options for people to run a different strategy. Um, it's something that's been talked about for a while, but and we might need to do it a few times before you pass complete judgment on it. But what it's done is that it, uh, it neatly packages the race so that the, the pit stop has little interference in the outcome. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, depending on your viewpoint. But you can't change the strategy, really. Everybody's locked on the same strategy, with the exception of how you choose to use your tyres. And we thought maybe Marcus might go on to a second set this afternoon that had been used a little more aggressively, and that might have hurt him, but that's proved to be absolutely wrong. Sounds like a good topic for V8 superstars, actually. You can get in there and adjudicate on all that. And once again, we've had this little bit of uh, breathing space injected into the top six drivers. Ambrose with that six to six and a half second buffer for the last few laps now. Bright still up. 20 seconds as Wills goes through on Todd Kelly. Now that's adjusted the order a little bit. He's doing a good job, isn't he? I mean, consider how much time he burned up in that stop. He's going to lose it here again, though, on the outside. It's a classic crisscross on the exit. Todd's got position for turn one. But uh, Simon Wills is showing great pace and consistency. It's just a fast car this weekend. He's going to have another look down the inside here at turn two. And uh, it's always, this is very pleasurable in a race car when you've got a car that's working pretty well and you can just box the ears of the other guys. You know, Simon's slowly but surely been making up for that lost opportunity from the earlier race. And uh, he now moves up into position seven. And there's the margin. Now, Ambrose and Scaife tied on 189. I've discussed that. Bright and Ingle. Third and fourth are tied on 177 points. Now, there's six seconds between them. In fact, nearly seven seconds between them. Don't know if that position will change, but I'm not altogether sure what happens there. I think Bright with the better result oh, in oh, race two oh. as they bump Bargwana and Radisic. Radisic is moving uh, onwards and upwards. In fact, uh, 13th position, not bad, considering where he started the weekend, but Bargwana's dropped back a bit. Of course, he's had some problems during the course of the racing. At this point in the weekend, the tyres are pretty second-hand. Don't forget also, we should plug this, the final uh, round of the Konica Minolda series from Malala, South Australia, next weekend. Big event, a lot of people in the hunt for the championship there. 
And if you're uh, watching us in South Australia and you want to see some of the up-and-coming youngsters and stars of the game in our second tier of V8 supercar competition, then I urge you to get out to Malala. Take a jacket, because it could be a bit breezy out there, but that'll be a great race. Oh, this is going to be tricky, he says. As he bites his lip. But if he'd gone on with that, that would have been uh, bits of plastic and paint scattered everywhere. Well, through the dog leg, if you'll pardon the pun, he's still nipping at Radisic's heels. And uh, Ambrose is just behind them. I had to pull out a really bad one for late in the race, didn't I? Someone passed me something blunt. <laughs> <laughs> Ambrose is flashing his lights at Barguada. He doesn't want any part of this. He wants to get through cleanly and get on with winning the race. Not long to go now to be a tragic time for Ambrose to run into some trouble. 11-6 last lap for Marcus, and now he's right in the middle of all this, and 11-4 for Marcus. 5.9 second margin, then Bright, Ingle, Wheel, Richards, Wills, Kelly, uh, Jason Richards, then Rick Kelly, and uh, space being made now for the race leader. Paul Morris, Greg Murphy, Paul Radisis, Jason Barguana, Craig Baird, Tony Longhurst coming into the fray a little after a quiet early part of the weekend. Stevie Johnson recovering from that pinion problem in the previous race. See the blue flags being shown both sides of the bridge. Three there. laps to go, Marcus. Three laps. Well, Radisic here is not in too bad shape. He's 13th, but he's about to be lapped by the race leader. Been a tremendous performance from Marcus Ambrose. And you know what? Pretty demoralising when you're out there doing your very best. You drive the wheels off the car. Your group of people that are working so hard behind the scenes are doing their best. And you realise that the best car in the field at the moment is able to put a lap on you in whatever it is, 51 laps, and you think, oh boy, have we got some work to do. Radisic allows Ambrose to go through, so no dramas there. The spectre was momentarily raised at what is probably now getting on to be ancient history, but uh, when Ford was really copying it from the line, they tended to bring themselves undone at crucial times. Scaife has closed up a is little bit for, a... well, actually 5.2 seconds. It's, it's, it's a little better, but it's not great on the last lap. That is a great shot. I always enjoy when we come to Oran Park, either for testing in years gone by or this weekend. You go and stand on the wall in the first session, just watch those cars go by. And uh, they're doing just on 250 k's at the point where the camera panned there. And there's a big induction sound as they come towards you and they whoosh by and the split of scrapes on the road breaking into turn one. And it's just it's fantastic to watch. It's even better to be in the driver's seat. Good little track, this one, but really complex, as I've mentioned a few times over the weekend. And when you haven't got a great car here, it makes for a very long afternoon. When your car works well, gee, it's good. And Marcus Ambrose, Stone Brothers Racing, and Mark Scape and the Holden Racing Team have delivered very good cars this weekend that work well, and they look good. They just look so much quicker than the other cars around them. I heard one radio signal earlier, and I'm sure uh, you at home would have heard it as well. Someone from Skase Garage telling him that he would win the day by finishing second in this race. We're on the final lap now. Mate. And uh, Marcus Ambrose has pretty clear road ahead of him. He's shaken free of this little bunch. Mark Scaife really can't do much about Ambrose. So will he bother trying to get through that lot? Jason Bright. Big gaps, aren't they, between first, second and third? A little unusual, really. That tends to be the case a bit here from time to time. What is notable when you look carefully at this car and the one following car number two is just how well they're behaving, Bill. They just don't lurch and roll and pitch all over the place. They soak up the bumps and the body doesn't react to it. The cars are turning, hitting the spot, making the apex, and the power is being applied aggressively and they're launching off to the next segment of the track and they're doing it well and these guys have done a great job this weekend hats off to marcus and his team flashing his lights not to move anyone out of the way but saluting the support that's turned up here at Oran park big crowd here this weekend a lot of blue in that sea of happy faces and marcus ambrose will deliver a race and round victory here a very important one well, too. Marcus, great effort, mate. Awesome start. After the disappointment of Winton, now Mark Scaife will finish equal on points. Right, mate. Thanks very much. But he's no championship yeah, threat. Fantastic uh, race that one, mate. Car was a lot better. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Ross. Thanks. And thanking Ross and Jim Stone, and, and you heard it. He said the car was a lot better. So whatever they changed between the races definitely had a positive influence on the car. They battled on Friday with scruffy old tyres on both Marcus's car and Russell's car. That hurt them. Jason Bright for third, good performance considering what happened to him on Friday with that lost engine. Whatever the reason, he 
got back, got points and stays in the hunt. And it's probably a lot to take away from this weekend for Mark as well. You know, pole position, great job in the shootout. One of the great laps that we've seen from Mark Scaife. And then a win in race one, second in race two. That's certainly nothing to be depressed about. No, curiously, uh, the round win was probably more important to Mark than it was to Marcus because Marcus is really only interested in the points from a championship point of view. And the, the round victory, while of course he will enjoy, they had another generational improvement in the engine in Mark Scaife's car this weekend. And so they feel like they're starting to recover some of the lost ground that they've given away in the early part of the season. The car's been reliable. And uh, we're on different occasions. It hasn't looked as though it's quite the pace of the SBR car. This weekend, both teams have given each other a great shake. And that's good for the competition. I spoke to him on Friday, and he was very surprisingly happy before the car had even turned a wheel. So yes, Neil, you're right. There's a, there's a lot in the wings for the Holden Racing team. Looking back through the placings, a great effort from Russell Ingle, and look at that. The Stone Brothers team once again standing out from the Ford crowd because it's all Holden but for them in the top ten. Rick Kelly fighting back to tenth. His brother Todd just a couple of positions ahead of him. Great result for Tasman this weekend. They'd be very pleased. 150 championship points for the only Sydney-based team. Further down the order, Paul Radicic fighting up to 13th. John Bauer fighting up to 18th. Marcus Ambrose celebrates a very interesting win. Tied for points with Mark Scape. But because he won race two, he takes the round victory. Takes a little bit of the sting out of the Holden Racing Team's performance this weekend. But both teams have been superb. As we look at the round points, not only were first and second tied, but Bright and Ingle were tied for third. Todd Kelly not all that far behind them and that does his championship chances the world of good as we take a look at the overall points now after the eight rounds you'll see that Bright leads Ambrose but not by much Stephen Richards is still in the hunt Rick Kelly also Russell Ingle is very much a factor and he said before this round he considered himself a championship chance still Greg Murphy Todd Kelly is within 250 points approximately of the leader in this championship and that's interesting because we have the endurance races still to come and then three solo rounds there's a lot of points still left in this championship as Stephen Johnson rounds out the top 20. let's hear from the men who are on the podium well after a tough weekend at Winton boy is that the way to get the championship defense back on track well done yeah I tell you we really needed that as a team um, and we really needed to fight back hard there and, and I've got to say um, the Ford guys out there today made it really easy for me, and so thank you very much for that. It's, it's been a tough couple of weeks for all the guys at Ford. You know, uh, we don't want everyone running into each other, and just please have bounced back so well. Good on you, Marcus, and good luck in the injury race. Yeah, thank you. Great. Well, Mark, it's still a positive weekend, but I think everyone's asking what happened at the beginning of pit lane during that race. I was just a bit eager to get into pit lane, and uh, when I looked up, Marcus had stopped a bit earlier than I thought he would, and I, and I was just going to spear straight into the back of him and spin us both around. So. Uh, I lost three seconds, I had to, you know, do another lap and, uh, you know, it cost me plenty. But, I mean, it was a very encouraging weekend for us, Daryl. You know, the car's been very, very good. Qualify pole, win the first race and had a great battle in the second race. So, um, you know, I cost myself any chance and, uh, you know, that's, that's life. Just got to get on with it. Well done, Mark. Thanks, mate. Well, it's been a trying weekend for you, Jason, but salvaging points is what's important and that's, uh, that's good for the title chase. Well done. Yeah, thanks, mate. It was, um, she was going to be a bit of an uphill struggle, struggle after Friday and, and missing, you know, that whole hour and a half session. So to get a podium was, um, you know, a great effort by all the guys. You know, we, we, we've been sort of chasing our tail a little bit this weekend, more than what we usually do. And, and uh, you know, the surface just doesn't suit us. But, you know, fortunately, we've um, we made, made just bag some good points still. Well, we're looking forward to Sandown and Bathurst now. Enjoy it up there, won't you? Cheers, mate. Try to.